I'm Ray Osman, and I'm co-director of the Center for Innovation in Informal STEM Learning at Arizona State University and the director of the National Informal STEM Education Network. In my talk today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do, where I do it, how I do it, especially three projects, and why I think it matters. My work is in a field called informal STEM education. The STEM part is short for science, technology, engineering, and math. And informal means that it's learning that happens outside of school or formal education. People learn in and out of school throughout their lives. We tend to associate learning with school, but actually, across an average person's life, there are many more opportunities to learn at home, at work, and in their community than at school. An average American spends only 5% of their time in the classroom, and even school-age kids only spend 20% of their waking hours. So if we want to support learning and understand how people learn, it's important to look outside the classroom as well as inside school. Another key thing about informal education is that we mean experiences and environments that are specifically designed for learning. People can learn anywhere, but my work focuses on museums and other places like that that offer opportunities for learning outside of school. Informal STEM educators try to be inclusive of everybody in a community, people of different ages, backgrounds, and abilities. So what do we know about learning outside of school? One key resource is a consensus document created in 2009 by the National Research Council. It's called Learning Science and Informal Environments. The committee that created this report looked across a range of research and evaluation studies. They found six strands of learning that were common learning outcomes across both formal and informal settings. And two of these were particularly associated with learning outside of school. The first was strand number one, which is experiencing excitement, interest, and motivation to learn science. And the other one was strand number six, which is people starting to think about themselves as science learners and develop an identity as someone who knows about, uses, and sometimes contributes to science. This report made a strong case for the idea that informal and formal learning, or learning that happens both in and out of school, are really complementary. People also draw on and develop a whole variety of more general skills and knowledge when they participate in science. For example, there are several frameworks related to 21st century skills, the skills we all need to work and to get along. A couple examples of these types of skills that I'm sharing here are learning and innovation skills, like critical thinking and problem solving, and life and career skills, such as uh, getting along socially and working with people from other cultures. Education experts are starting to think about the different places that people learn as part of a learning ecosystem. This perspective emphasizes the importance of making connections across formal, informal, and everyday learning experiences. It also advocates for different organizations in a community to think about how their programs connect together. So that was a quick introduction to the field of informal STEM education. Now I'm going to talk about a bit of the work we do in my research center at ASU. We focus on how people learn STEM in informal environments. In particular, we focus on creating experiences that help people understand our world today and think about the future that we want to create. We're based at a university, but we work with many different organizations in our community, especially places like museums and libraries. Our goal is to create innovative experiences that we can share broadly. One way that we do this is through the National Informal STEM Education Network, or NISE Network. NISNet partners work together to develop resources, including public engagement materials and professional development materials. We share our resources with each other and connect with each other to share best practices and new ideas. We have project teams that develop different materials. We then distribute them across the country, and our partners implement them locally. Our resources are open source, and we encourage all our partners to adapt them and make them work better for them and the learners in their community. Hundreds of organizations participate in the network, and together we reach millions of people each year. Now I'm going to share three different projects to give a sense of the kind of work that we do. The first one is a large project on chemistry, which is done through the NISE network. The second is a smaller project that looks at responsible research and innovation. And the third is a project we did just through the center that focuses on science and religion. Our chemistry project is a partnership of the NISE network and the American Chemical Society. This project was motivated by reports in both the United States and the United Kingdom that chemistry is less appealing to learners than other science subjects. It's also not often presented in science museums and other informal learning environments, so people's only experience of chemistry may have been in high school a long time ago. This means that people don't have a lot of opportunities to become interested in chemistry throughout their lifetime. Now you remember that places like museums are important to helping people develop interest in learning science, so we felt that addressing this gap could help solve the problem. 
The research question we have for this project is, how should hands-on activities be designed to increase participants' sense of interest, relevance, and self-efficacy related to chemistry? And we looked at several aspects of the activities that we developed to understand this better. Um, we looked at the chemistry content in the activities that we developed. We looked at the format and structure of the activities themselves, the way they were designed. And finally, we looked at the ways that educators and scientists shared them with the public, what techniques that they were, they were using. We used a process called design-based research in this project. In this methodology, researchers and educators work together. They identify a question or a problem, they design an intervention, and they test it in a real-world setting that is not in a lab. The team then uses the data they get to improve their design, and this cycle could continue several times. At the end, the process provides findings for research and implications for practice. In our case, we also created a set of materials that embodied our findings. Here's an example of one activity. It's called the nature of dye. In this activity, participants create their own dyes by crushing up bugs and mixing them with safe chemicals. Here are a few of the materials from the activities. You can see the activity guide. I've got the English versions here, and you can also see a couple of the materials that they used, um, an activity mat and a pH scale, and those I'm showing you this, the Spanish version. We studied a dozen different activities like that one and learned a lot about specific design strategies that supported our three learning goals of interest, relevance, and self-efficacy. Here I'll highlight a few of these strategies that were related to the nature of dye activity. So for interest, one important strategy related to activity format was the way the activity allowed participants to combine materials, make predictions, observe the results, and understand what led to different colors of dye. For relevance, the activity included cards that connected this kind of dye, which is made out of kind of bugs called cochineal bugs, um, to food and cosmetics that they might use, such as macaroni and cheese. Um, the cards also shared uh, examples of other kinds of natural dyes as well as synthetic dyes. And so this was a chemistry content strategy that was connecting chemistry to people's everyday life and experience. Um, and finally, a strategy related to self-efficacy um, was making the format really simple to do and easy to understand. Once people got the hang of it, they could take control and do their own experiments and sort of make predictions and observations and see what happened. We also looked at the facilitation strategies, so the different techniques or moves that educators and scientists use when they shared these activities with the public. We used an existing framework that looked at three different categories of facilitation moves, um, moves that were designed to invite participation and keep people engaged as they worked through the activity, um, moves that supported exploration, so help participants explore what was happening at the activity, and finally moves that help participants deepen their understanding of what was happening at the activity. One key thing we found is that facilitation strategies support engagement and learning generally rather than specifically. So what that means is the same constellation of strategies supported all three of our learning outcomes, interest, relevance, and self-efficacy, rather than some strategies being associated with interest or others with self-efficacy. Another key thing we found is that these strategies really are similar to the kinds of moves or techniques that educators and scientists might use for other kinds of hands-on activities, not just chemistry and actually not just science. We also looked at what kind of facilitation moves educators used and when they used them as they did the activity. And one takeaway here that I really want to highlight is that skilled educators spend the majority of their time in a supporting role. So 58% of the different moves that they use are focused on supporting the exploration of the learners. So rather than talking themselves or sharing their own information, they're really guiding and supporting learners in doing their own thing. So altogether, we created eight activities that we packaged in a physical activity kit and we distributed these activities to 250 different museums and also um, chapters of ACS across the country. And there were two reasons that we wanted to uh, produce physical activity kits of a subset of the activities that we tested. Um, first, our field generally learns by doing, just like our learners learn by doing, so do we as educators and researchers. Um, and so we felt that sharing activities that demonstrated the strategies that we found effective would be a great way to share our research findings with the field. Um, and second, this broad implementation at so many sites across the country um, is giving us an opportunity to look more at the implementation of the activities in different places, and that work is still ongoing. So overall, this project is an example of how we study learning and how we really understand what we can do, what strategies we can use as educators to support the kinds of learning outcomes that we value. The second project I'm going to share focuses on an idea called responsible research and innovation. 
This was part of a global celebration of the 200th anniversary of the publication of Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein. Our goals for this project were to help learners practice 21st century skills, such as creativity and collaboration, um, explore STEM content, including emergent, emerging technologies uh, like artificial intelligence, robotics, synthetic biology, and human enhancement, and reflect on responsible research and innovation. And those are really ideas that Mary Shelley was exploring through the novel Frankenstein. Um, in order to do this, we really needed to first define what kinds of learning we thought were appropriate um, and useful for people in an informal learning setting. And then we created activities that we thought would support that learning and studied how they worked. So the framework that we created included sort of three big categories of ideas. The first was creativity and innovation. So providing opportunities for learners to create something new or improve something that exists. The second big category was anticipation and reflexivity. And by this we meant thinking through the possible consequences of something that they made and considering what's good for individuals, for society as a whole, and for the natural environment. And the last set of ideas was inclusion and responsiveness, and that was helping people to make decisions in the design and the implementation of an innovation to maximize the benefits to people in the environment and to minimize negative consequences. So these were a lot of big ideas, and our goal was to develop activities that would let people of all ages think through and practice some of these ideas and some of these skills in informal learning environments. And we ended up using two key strategies, two design strategies um, that we found successful. The first was um, choosing activities that had motivating challenges. So they had some kind of a challenge that people just intrinsically were interested in doing and wanted to do, motivated them to participate in and complete the activity. And there were two different kinds of activities within the, that had this kind of challenge that we ended up using. One were making and tinkering activities, so kind of open-ended um, activities. And the second were science inquiry activities that allowed participants to discover something, particularly science that was related to um, the novel Frankenstein or, or Mary Shelley's period. And the second big strategy that we used, we called productive talk. Um, and that was providing opportunities for reflection and conversation about some of the ideas that appear in the novel and some of the ideas in our framework um, of, of responsible research and innovation. And we had two, two primary ways we did this as well. One was creating connections to the story and helping people think through ideas that they might know from the characters of Frankenstein or the ideas in that story. And the second were a set of questions that um, were kind of interesting to think about and, and prompted conversation among learners. And here's a couple examples of the activities we developed. Um, one was called Spark of Life and was really looking at how um, our bodies can conduct electricity. Um, we know that Victor Frankenstein used, used this as well as scientists of Mary Shelley's time. A second activity is called Doe Creature, or some people may know it as Squishy Circuits. And this is a maker type activity that lets uh, learners make their own creature out of conductive Play-Doh and then bring it to life with a battery pack. So having lights that light up or buzzers that buzz or pieces that move. Um, so taking on in some ways the role of a creator uh, like Victor Frankenstein. And this activity is connected to research in synthetic biology and genetic engineering. And here too, we created physical activity kits that we shared with museums, in this case about a little over 50 museums across the US. Um, this project, I think, is a good example of how informal STEM professionals define learning goals and then create activities that support those goals, think through the kinds of activities that will support those learning goals. The final project that I'm going to share is focused on the relationship of science and religion. Uh, we wanted to understand if people really saw science and religion as being in conflict, the way we often perceive it to be. Um, and whether that has to be the case or whether we can find a way for people to um, come together and think about this topic without it being controversial. Some background information for this. Uh, in 2015, the Pew Research Center did a poll of Americans looking at their beliefs about science and religion um, and found that most Americans do perceive that science and religion um, are in conflict with each other, but they don't think that's the case in their own experience. They don't feel like their religious beliefs and science are in conflict. So it's an interesting finding. It suggests that this might be more of a perception, this idea that science and religion are in conflict, than it is of people's own views. So in this project, we developed five programs. Um, and these uh, different organizations took the lead on each of these programs um, in different parts of the country. We had different target audiences or different people that we were hoping to engage in thinking about science and religion. 
and we'd use different program formats. And we deliberately had this variation because we saw this as a really exploratory or experimental project to look at techniques to tackle subjects that might be controversial, but instead of creating controversy, really providing an opportunity for people to listen to each other's views and think about alternatives to their own opinions. Um, we did use a set of common approaches across all of the projects, and that gave us some continuity and some ability to compare these different programs. The first thing is we really tried to use an inclusive approach, and we were very explicit about this. So we let people know that we were inviting different viewpoints about the relationship between science and religion, and that we weren't trying to change anyone's mind, and we weren't trying to say that one viewpoint was right or one was wrong. And this was important to having people feel comfortable participating in the programs. Second is that we used a perspective that is sometimes called an interaction perspective. And in this perspective, we really asked people to search for understanding rather than agreement with each other. So the idea was to share each other's views and understand each other's views, but we weren't trying to have people agree with each other necessarily. And so we really focused on creating opportunities for reflection and conversation and giving people a chance to share their values and their perspectives and their experiences and hear from others in a non-confrontational way. The third thing that we did is we used storytelling techniques. And so each program was inspired by a story that looked at the relationship of science and religion, really written um, in a first-person perspective from somebody who had thought about this um, and had kind of interesting things to say about it. And we found that sharing personal narratives provided a good entry point for visitors. So um, we didn't use the sort of universal voice of authority. We provided this personal perspective, and that let people, in some cases, think about the characters um, or share ideas with each other and not feel like we were presenting an idea, a perspective that we felt was correct and that they should adopt. Um, another thing that we did across all the programs was make sure that they were participatory. So we provided a variety of ways for people to take part in the activities um, that were appropriate to the audience and to the setting. And then the last thing we did is we embedded the evaluation that we did on these programs. And what that means is we really integrated it into the program itself. Um, and we felt that was important for this kind of topic, that people weren't feeling like they were being studied. Um, and so we embedded the evaluation into some of the activities and this particular reflection and sharing activities that were part of the programs themselves. So I'll just quickly describe uh, the variety of programs that we ended up developing. The Museum of Life and Science, which is in North Carolina, um, their program was inspired by the story of a pediatric nurse, and she works with critically sick children um, and talks about how she thinks of God in the context of her daily experience with children who are very sick and sometimes die. And this museum partnered uh, with a storytelling organization that does live storytelling, as well as a historic theater, and they created a live storytelling event for adults. So they had several different um, stories that were focused on medicine and religion, and these were all told by a person standing up on stage and talking directly to the audience about their experience. And so the author of the story that inspired this event was one of the speakers. Um, and they provided prompts for conversation reflection so that people could talk between the stories with the people that they had come to the program with. Another program we did was inspired by a story, um, a man who is an Anglican priest and a scientist and was really interested in spiritual experiences. And uh, he happened to have a disease that caused him sometimes to have experiences that the scientist in him said was caused by his disease, but the priest or the religious side of him said felt spiritual in nature. And so it's a story that really thinks about spirituality and science and, and what we can know about altered states. Um, and this was a partnership of our university, ASU, and an outdoor arts festival that takes place in Phoenix. Um, the arts festival is free and open and a attracts a really broad public audience, um, but particularly a lot of young adults go um, and sort of browse around the festival. Um, and the sort of core activity that we offered is um, something called One Question or 50 Answers. And in this um, people agree to be videotaped and to be asked a question that they don't know what it is ahead of time, and they sort of have an impromptu response. And so we ask participants to share their thoughts about the relationship between science and spirituality. Another very different program was created by the Children's Creativity Museum, and they're in San Francisco. 
Um, and they were inspired by a story that was really exploring all the senses in the world's religion and thinking about how breathing and meditation are related to religion, how sound and music are related to religion, how sort of patterns and art are related to people's religious experience. And the Children's Creativity Museum created a, a mindfulness workshop for families in the museum, and they could do a whole handful of hands-on activities that would help kids think about being mindful and also had uh, connections to science and to religion. Um, the Museum of Science in Boston was inspired by a story about a Catholic school on the U.S.-Mexican border. Um, and this school has girls from both countries, U.S. and Mexico, and provide really excellent STEM education. They're known for this. Um, and so the sisters in this school um, really view their role as supporting the girls' religious education as well as a really rigorous science education. And so the program that the Museum of Science developed was a teacher professional development workshop for science teachers that were focused in faith-based schools. And finally, the last program of this project was developed by the Science Museum of Minnesota in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, and it was inspired by a story about Johannes Kepler and his life work. And Kepler, like Galileo, um, found that his scientific research brought him into conflict with the church. And this, as a deeply religious man, was very difficult for him throughout his lifetime. Um, the museum created a science theater program for family audiences. And they adapted the familiar storyline of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. So Kepler is visited by three ghosts, talks about his research and the challenges he faces throughout the program. So you can see that each of these programs is very different and is designed to work with different audiences in different settings, but all explore this core idea about whether religion and science are really in conflict or not. And what we found is that our visitors had a range of perspectives. Some felt they were in conflict, some felt that they could coexist, and some felt there was no conflict at all. But we were surprised to find that overwhelmingly visitors welcomed the opportunity to talk with other people about their perspectives um, and didn't find it controversial or uncomfortable. I think this project is a good example of how informal educators really work to tailor a program to the people that they're engaging, whether it's a family audience or educators that work in faith-based schools, and really create the kind of participatory and inclusive experience that will work for that audience in the particular setting that the program is taking place. Finally, I'm going to close by explaining the theory of change we have for our research center and for the network. And this is really how it is that we think this work can make a difference. So in our center, we try to develop innovative learning experiences. I've described how we do that with different community partners, uh, how we do that really thinking about learners. Um, and we try to develop things that will empower communities to contribute to change locally and to help develop the kind of future that they would like to live in. But the other thing that we try to do is create things that are scalable or transferable. And what I mean by that is that we can share them with other organizations and those ideas, those materials, those programs, that learning can be done in other places, not just locally to us at ASU. And what that means is that we have many different people across the country doing something, maybe 250 sites doing chemistry activities. Um, and that really provides uh, a lot greater impact. And we start having um, many more people learning about the same thing. So our idea is that we can contribute to a better future by having providing more opportunities for learning in more places. And so together, the Research Center and the NIAS Network we have um, worked with over 800 partners worldwide. We currently estimate that about 17 million people a year participate in the whole variety of projects and activities that we have going on just specific to the, the work that we do. Um, and these activities take place in all 50 states of the US, several US territories, um, and in 33 different countries. I wanna thank our funders. I would like to thank our project team members who worked on these three projects that I share with you as well as all our collaborators that we have in the Center for Innovation and Informal STEM Learning and the National Informal STEM Education Network. Thank you.